As you both attorneys know, before being a judge, I was a deputy attorney general in the HPD section. The medical board was one of my clients. I also served on several task forces for the medical board. I don't know anything about this case other than what I've read. I don't see any grounds under Government Code 11425.4 or 11512 subdivision C to recuse myself. If anyone would like to make a motion to recuse me, I would entertain that at this time. Mr. Davis? Mr. With that, the proceeding will proceed as follows. Uh, Mr. Orsonoff, you will have 15 minutes. Mr. Davis, you will have 15. And then Mr. Orsonoff, you will have five in rebuttal, as, as will you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Orsonoff? Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, members of the panel, uh, on its face, uh, this is a, appears to be, a straightforward case of relapse in the midst of an otherwise excellent recovery program. How could the ALJ otherwise. Uh, once again, reality is stranger than fiction. Uh, the evidence in this case uh, showed that Dr. Berge was drugged by his own girlfriend. The administrative law judge, uh, Judge Alvin, who was presiding the administrative law judge at OAH, uh, found that the more persuasive evidence in this case is that Dr. Berge was involuntarily drugged. And while drugged, he made a drink of alcohol while he was involuntarily drugged. If that's the case, then the state didn't prove the case by clear and convincing evidence. If that was proved by persuasive evidence that he was involuntarily drugged, the state certainly didn't prove the case by clear and convincing evidence to command the unhesitating intent of all reasonable minds. Now, the presiding ALJ, Judge Albert, didn't lose his reasonable mind in this case. And I would caution the board not to rewrite the ALJ's decision. As unlikely, incredible as the story sounds on its face, uh, we have hearings in cases like this to decide these matters. Uh, hearings that go on for multiple days so that all the evidence can be presented by both sides, the witnesses can appear, and their testimony is uh, examined, cross-examined, uh, their demeanor can be observed, and that's very important in a credibility case such as this. And an ALJ who is experienced in determining credibility issues and in evaluating the witnesses and in weighing the evidence uh, can make a recommended decision to the board. Now, uh, the board has wisely delegated the evaluation of witnesses and evidence to ALJs. This board can't spend a week as happened here, a week was spent on this case, a week with a case. The board may disagree with penalty determination and the terms and conditions of probation, and sometimes this board does. But it's quite another matter to overturn a decision entirely, especially with credibility determination by an experienced ALJ like Judge Albert who served the case for a week. Uh, not in the order of not adoption, uh, what says there is that the usual state oral argument shall be directed only to the question of whether the proposed penalty should be modified. Uh, the that standard language, obviously that's not applicable here since there was no penalty. So the reason for that standard language is because most of the time what this board does is examine whether the penalty is appropriate or not. Here it's dismissal. Uh, so the only issue is whether the decision should be overturned and rewritten. Well, why is it? As I suppose if we look at it, it should be dismissed or not dismissed. Why wasn't the evidence for voluntary intoxication clear and convincing to a reasonable certainty? Um, let's have a reason for this. First of all, uh, no witness observed Dr. Berkey's drinking or order. He did so in a public place after all. He got kicked out along with others where there were servers, where there was a manager who kicked them out. Uh, the people who were with him, the complainant in this case, took the Fifth Amendment on the stand. They didn't want to perjure herself by denying that she had drugged him and didn't want to incriminate herself by admitting that she had drugged him. Her friend, uh, Lenita Erickson, who was there drinking her drinking buddy, never took the thing. Uh, now, the sheriff's officers in this case, effectively, the 
Cherikov to testify that Dr. Berge was out of his mind under the influence of some mind-altering substance they assumed it was alcohol. It is not clear what substances were involved. Uh, one, the sheriff who, uh, deputy who took him to the station didn't even record that he smelled any alcohol uh, on Dr. Berge's breath. Dr. Berge himself couldn't recall much at all from the end of his dinner that early evening until he regained awareness in the jail cell the next morning. He was certainly not himself. He was verbally belligerent. He used expletives. He was provocative. And this is on tape. The sheriff takes this uh, ride to the car to the station. He was totally out of his character by every other bit of testimony you've heard about Dr. Berge. He was a very respectful uh, person. Um, he was uh, not uh, any way consistent that the expert witnesses testified with alcohol intoxication. But he was never tested at the scene or in the station. Uh, he, there were no field sobriety tests. There was no urine test, blood test, breath test, nothing. Uh, random test, because he was in a the diversion program, uh, random tests were done three days later uh, for alcohol and common street drugs, but they were negative. Uh, he was arrested at the time for public intoxication, released, and not charged. Um, this was not a criminal conviction case where the board can rely upon a criminal conviction uh, and the record of the criminal case. There is no such criminal conviction uh, at issue in this case. No, and no one is contesting that he was under the influence. The issue is, was it voluntary or involuntary? Uh, the officer simply couldn't speak to that issue. Um, now, the Deputy Attorney General has pointed out uh, in uh, his brief on page 7 uh, that the respondent and CS, not patient, but the name of the relationship, was intact in February of 2009 and did not start to falter until the business relationship between them went sour in the summer and fall of 2009. Well, uh, the evidence is to the contrary. Uh, the relationship uh, started falling apart before that had its ups and downs, and that ignores the fact that uh, there was a substantial amount of evidence that on the trip they had just taken to Hawaii, and from which they had just returned the very day of the arrest, they had a huge blow-up. Uh, he told her he didn't want the relationship uh, to be on a business level. He had the job for her at the hospital. He wanted it to be on a personal level. Uh, the, their relationship would not be contingent, he said, on his savings or marketing job at the hospital that he had gotten for her. She was doing nothing on the job, and people uh, were complaining. They testified about her lack of performance and how difficult she was to deal with at the hospital where Dr. Berkey worked. Now, she got very mad at him. On the trip to Hawaii, they argued. She kicked him out of the room. He went to the other side of the island, essentially. Uh, and she falsely reported him at that time in Hawaii to the Hawaiian police for physically abusing her. The Hawaiian police investigated. They examined her. They, they didn't even arrest him because there was absolutely no evidence of physical abuse. They met again a few days later on the airplane returning to California. They made up, and they decided uh, to try to have a relationship. The arrest occurred that, that very night. She was still upset with him about their fight in Hawaii and that he wouldn't help her keep her job. So she had motivations. She wanted to get rid of him for the evening and have fun with her drinking buddy girlfriend, Lydia Erickson. He had become boring for her. Why? Because he was in a diversion program. He was no longer a drinking buddy. And he was drinking his ice teas and decaffeinated Red Bull. Four. She had a history, not just a motive of, to do this to him. She had a history of drugging him in order to go out with her girlfriend. That's a history that she admitted. She's not just the Dr. Berkey who testified that she admitted to him that she had drugged him that evening, but the two women whom she was very friendly with. One is Allison Jordan, who was his on-site monitor in his office, 
client a year um, after a three-year uh, relationship. So he's doing very well. Uh, I submit that he is an asset to the community. He has wonderful training at Loma Linda, the Mayo Clinic, with Peter Sinai. Uh, he is an outstanding uh, spine surgeon. He has done a youth program and then some with being the poster child, according to the president of Interestingly, and it's in the transcripts, the meeting 
after February 20th, 2009, when Dr. Berge went to his diversion program, he never told them that he was involuntarily intoxicated. He never told them he was supposed to drug. Despite his testimony that Kathy Foss admitted it the next day, he goes to diversion. The very people that su uh, su subject him to random drug testing, and he does not say, hey, you know, you should know I was supposed to Mickey on February 20th. No. All he says to them is, I got feisty with the police. Because the story about involuntary intoxication hadn't simmered enough yet. That didn't, that didn't really percolate until after the medical board filed its accusation. Um, also, with, with regard to involuntary intoxication, um, there's a jury instruction that defines what involuntary intoxication is, and it defines it um, when the intoxication is produced in a person without his willing and knowing use of intoxicating liquor and without his willing assumption of the risk of possible intoxication. Here, um, Dr. Berge's own expert, um, Mr. Kucinich, stated that it's consistent with his opinion that Dr. Berge suffered a period of amnesia due to this mystery drug he was split, but that he would still be able to act volitionally while under the influence or, while, or during that period of amnesia. Just because he doesn't remember what happened during this window of time, assuming he was actually drugged, doesn't mean he couldn't act volitionally and drink alcohol, which he did based on the testimony of the sheriff's deputies, which all smelled it on him. Um, and second, the second prong of that jury instruction is <coughs> assuming the risk. He testified that he had a relapse plan, and that relapse plan precludes him from hanging around slippery places, people, and things. Well, going to three bars in a night as a known alcoholic with three DUIs and admitted alcoholic with a known trigger, Kathy Foss, puts him in a position where he assumed the risk. So this involuntary intoxication defense doesn't meet the legal definition and factually doesn't cut it as well. The accusation also charged Dr. Berge with dishonesty. That's based on his statements to the medical board investigators that he was always in compliance with his diversion program and that he didn't drink on February 20th, 2009. There was also a videotape of Dr. Berge in the back of a limo Dr. Berge testified that this was made on May 1st, 2009, a couple of months after the arrest. I would again encourage and ask the board to view this videotape. In this videotape, Dr. Berge is, to the lay person's eye, clearly drunk. He's fumbling with his cigarette, he's belligerent, he's throwing litter out the window, his eyes are bloodshot, and he's got a bottle of beer between his lap, in his lap. His testimony is he was acting in a reality show, and that the beer was a prop. I submit to you that that is not credible. Re watch the video. It speaks for itself. Um, again, he's prior to that making of the video, he, he also testified that he'd been out of the bar singing with a band as part of the videotape for this reality show. Again, he's subjecting himself things that are going to lead to relapse. Um, alcoholism is a horrible disease, and, and Dr. Berger's <coughs> question during the, the, the hearing is to whether he's ever drank against his will. By the very definition of being an alcoholic, you're powerless over alcohol. When you put yourself in these positions, you're going to drink. It's like the old saying, if you hang around the barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. It's the same for an alcoholic in these drinking establishments. Um, the clear and convincing evidence here, and, and much of it is circumstantial, but there is nothing in the law that precludes the decision maker and the fact finder from sus for suspending common sense in these cases. Look at the video, listen to the tape, read the testimony of the officers, and consider that this, this involuntary intoxication defense has holes in it. He never admitted it to his to his uh, diversion program. The two people that say that Kathy Foss admitted it, it's hearsay upon hearsay, never reported it, either to Dr. Berkey or to the authorities. It just doesn't add up. This was cooked up after the fact to defend against this very case. 
Um, if the board finds that, there are, that the allegations contained in the accusation are sustained, um, including the dishonesty allegation, which would be based on Dr. Berge's dishonest statements to the board and his dishonest testimony under oath at the hearing, revocation should be the disciplinary order. But at a minimum, he should be, revocation should be um, ordered with uh, a stay, and five years probation should be the disciplinary order with a controlled substance, um, abstain from use term, uh, alcohol abstain from use term, biological fluid testing, and ethics course, and all standard terms and conditions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Osson, you have five minutes. All right, thank you. Um, so it's going to bar, but the evidence in this case on February 20th, 2009, is that he went uh, with his girlfriend and her girlfriend to uh, a Mexican restaurant for, for an early dinner there. It's been on Hawaii time and they went for an early dinner there. By the end of the dinner, he didn't know uh, where he was or recall where he was going. Uh, he had uh, absolutely vague recollection from the time that dinner ended to the, to the time that uh, he wound up in jail the next morning. Uh, now, he had difficulty with drawing formulations. One wonders why he stayed with this uh, uh, young lady uh, for, uh, not the young, but uh, stay, stay with this woman who was drugging him. Uh, well, uh, according to his psychologist, uh, he simply had learned how to draw up from relationships and not enough professional conduct. Um, to do so. Unfortunately, he has learned that he's now in a very good relationship. Uh, he's not contesting, we're not contesting that he was out of his mind on the video, on, on the audio tape in the car, uh, in, in the sheriff's car. He, he was completely out of his mind then. He had been involuntarily uh, drunk. Uh, now, the involuntary intoxication defense, that is not an affirmative defense. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't shift the burden. This burden has never shifted to Dr. Berge to prove that. Uh, he simply had to raise evidence questioning whether there was clear and convincing evidence that he was voluntarily intoxicated. He has certainly done much more than that. Uh, whether or not the burden of persuasion is met, there is no such burden on Dr. On Dr. Berge to prove uh, that defense. It's the burden entirely remaining with, with the Attorney General's office to prove by clear and convincing evidence, which they did not do, uh, that he was voluntarily intoxicated. Um, now, uh, the other issue, uh, did he act voluntarily, he acted voluntarily while on an intoxicated state? Well, that's like saying someone gets a date rape drug, can't remember what happened, and then whatever happened on the date rape was, uh, was volitional. Uh, that is not this. Uh, as far as uh, complaining to the Authorities. Well, neither did the board investigator complain uh, to peace officers when she found out from Foss that Foss had committed criminal acts by, uh, uh, by on at least two occasions, uh, admitted to the investigator uh, that she had drugged Dr. Dr. Berge involuntarily. Um, so no one reported to the police. On the other hand, he did report to the version that he was slipped and drugged. They did find that he did not slip out of his um, uh, out of his sobriety, his, his continued sobriety. He just didn't tell them who did it. He told his psychiatrist, the psychologist the next week, Dr. Sutkin, who did it. This is way before any, any development of such a uh, involuntary intoxication defense. Remember, he was never charged with anything criminal. They, they released him, they didn't charge him. So uh, that was not a concern at the time of Dr. Berge. Uh, and finally, as far as the uh, May 1st, 2009 video, the two-minute video that the complainant gave the board out of 10 hours of taping when uh, she had been told, they had been told that they needed to make this production more outrageous. They were told that by the uh, MPD or whoever the equivalent was in London, uh, that they needed to act as outrageous as possible. So they have an outrageous two minutes of, of, uh, of, uh, of acting by Dr. Berge. Uh, this, this is not even charged by the board, and of course it isn't charged, because the very next day was the EPD test. 
which eliminated the possibility of uh, that he would have had any alcohol at that time. That was negative. Uh, and so uh, we submit that the complainant was completely lying in her, in her complaint report. She then refuses to testify, uh, well, she testifies to take the fifth to every question. That, uh, there is no evidence that proving this by clear and convincing evidence or reason to certainty to command the, uh, the effect of all the reasonable minds in the case, of course not. Do not overrule, do not reverse the reasonable administrative law judge who heard this case for a week to examine all the many witnesses who were uh, present. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Davis? Thank you. With regard to his telling his diversion counselor, I would invite the board to read the testimony of Dr. Berge at volume 5 of the reporter's transcript, page 169, lines 22 through 25, um, as well as, I believe it's page 222, lines 5 through 8. Um, it's clear that he did not tell the very people that were going to randomly drug test him that he'd been sent. <laughs> With regard to um, Kathy Foss's drugging him on February 20th, 2009, the testimony in the case is that they'd mended their relationship and they were back together. She had a business relationship with Dr. Berge that she valued very much. She also intervened when the police arrived in an effort to protect Dr. Berge. That's why she got into an altercation with the police. She was protecting Dr. Berge. That is completely inconsistent with somebody who's motivated to take him down by flipping him an illicit drug. Furthermore, there was nothing in the police reports that indicated any drugs were found on her at the time. Um, so the story about involuntary intoxication just doesn't hold water based on the reasons I've, I've previously argued. Um, Dr. Berge did call two experts, um, one to address what he believed caused his behavior in the tape and on the video, that was uh, Mr. Kucinich. And he, he testified that his opinion was based on the rapid onset and rapid end of Dr. Berge's conduct. Well, on cross-examination, it was determined that Mr. Kucinich had no idea how fast the behavior came on or when it ended. The tape ends at, at the jail. So he, and he's still acting as if he's intoxicated. So Dr. Kucinich has no idea when it ended, which chips away at one of the foundations of his opinions. He also, he did admit that the objective signs as observed by Deputy Sibley and Aldrich were consistent with alcohol intoxication. Dr. Berkey also had a voice expert, Dr. Yonovic, listen to the tape in the back of the police car and view the video. And his conclusion was that there was no slurring. So therefore, it was unlikely he was intoxicated by alcohol. On cross-examination, Dr. Yonovitz admitted that he relied on a study that stands for the proposition that oftentimes slurring does not appear until one's blood alcohol content is between 0.11 and 0.20, and that 20% of individuals don't slur when they're intoxicated. Again, I invite you to listen to the tape um, and judge for yourself. Um, with regard to his diversion program, part of the defense here is, well, I, after the videotape, I took a, a drug and alcohol test right after and it came up negative. Well, this is the same diversion program that the board stopped utilizing because of its problems. There was testimony at hearing that the urinalysis portion and the drug testing portion of the diversion program was problematic. The Civic Assistance Group is just a continuation of the board's former diversion program, which didn't work. Also, there was testimony from Ramona Drake from Civic Assistance Group about the monitoring program that Dr. Berge was supposed to be adhering to. One of the, one of the requirements was that employees not to act as a monitor. Well, he's got Allison Jordan, who works for him, acting as his monitor. Also, they're supposed to um, provide quarterly reports to the Pacific Assistance Group. Um, it was their 
was testimony that Mr. Drake rarely ever called Allison Jordan and that they didn't supply any kind of quarterly report. So to rely on a program that is flawed and remains flawed doesn't hold much water. In addition, um, you would think that he'd been drugged. These drugs would have showed up on the tests too, but they didn't either. So to rely on the tests, I, I would caution against that. I submit that they're unreliable. In essence, Dr. Berge is an admitted alcoholic who surrounded himself with known triggers and went to bars on February 20th, 2009, and ended up drinking. That's what the evidence establishes in this case. Um, his his uh, counselor, Dr. Sukhan, I believe her name is, um, testified it's not uncommon when addicts expose themselves to triggers, they experience sluts or relapses. Um, this ultimately calls into question if the board uh, believes the case has been established, calls into question Dr. Berge's credibility as he's maintained this defense from the very beginning of the hearing process. Um, that does not speak well his fitness to continue as a doctor. Again, if the board finds that the case has been established, I would ask that either revocation or probationary term with the terms and conditions I mentioned before be imposed. Thank you very much. And if the board has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. The panel members may have questions. I would caution the panel members, though you cannot elicit new evidence, you can just ask for clarification of the evidence in front of you. So I'll start from my right. Sir, do you have any questions? Um, the attorney, uh, the assistant attorney general made reference to a jury instruction. And I just, it's my understanding that that is not binding on this panel. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Back to board, we'll go into closed session. I'd ask everyone to please leave the room. And I thank you all for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.